My name is Rudy Gefährlich, or Berlich, as I've heard it pronounced here quite often, but it's actually pronounced Berlich. I'm going to talk about an application or application environment, a library collection that uses Boost. I'm not a Boost author, I'm a Boost user, and I want to talk about a particular use case and about some of my experiences. We can discuss that at the end of my presentation. Uh, before I do this, uh, I just want to give some reference to the guys who actually paid the airfare here, and I'm here standing here with two different hats on. And this is Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, my employer, or one of my employers at this point of time, probably. Um, and in there is Steinbuch Center for Computing. KIT consists of two large campuses in Germany, in the, in the south of Germany, about 100 miles south of Frankfurt. Um, and there are um, two campuses. Well, um, this one used to be, used to do nuclear research only. Now it's also doing, um, for example, research in um, environmental studies in many different other areas, including grid and cloud computing, which is the Nostalgia Center for Computing. I've looked up, um, as any good scientist would do, on Wikipedia the amount of people work living here in Aspen, and it was some 6,000 people, and this is pretty much how much how many people work at KRT. Um, so this, this is like a little um, village doing research in the south of Germany. And this is the second head that I have on, um, Gemfony, or Gemfony Scientific to be correct. And this is a startup, a spin-off from KRT, from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And, uh, well, we are two physicists and a uh, chemist, so we've got quite some experience with modeling complex systems. For example, in the context of particle physics, we work quite a bit with uh, CERN, for example, also in the context of grid and cloud computing. We've, of course, got experience with optimization, grid and cloud management, IT security. And the main product of this company is called the Geneva Library, for reasons that I hope become obvious a little bit later. Uh, Geneva stands for grid-enabled evolutionary algorithms, but extends beyond what the name suggests currently. What it does is it provides you with the ability to do accelerated parametric optimization for problems from a very wide array of problem domains, both in industry and science. And as I said, it's very heavily based on Boost. With that said, let me just ask who in this room has heard the term parametric optimization before. Quite a few actually on the way to the other room and back here I've been asked twice what it actually means. So I think I'll explain it anyway. Before I do this, amongst those who have heard the term, who has used parametric optimization to improve the results of his or her work, or his work in this case? Who, who hasn't? <laughs> so, co-workers have, but not me personally. Right. So, um, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. First, I want to give you some sort of a definition of what parametric optimization means to me. Uh, give you just some, example of, some examples of possible use cases, talk about the Geneva Library itself, and as it's open source, talk about my experiences with open source and the experiences we've made with using Boost as one of the strongest foundations of the Geneva Library. If you look around, then you will certainly see that optimization problems can be found in just about every field of engineering, natural sciences, uh, business and economics and every other part of life. Whenever you say, I want the biggest, the largest, the fastest, then probably there's some sort of an optimization problem behind it. And more to the point, um, one example would be the optimization of combustion engines. So imagine you've got a simulation that tells you how good or bad uh, the combustion in the engine works, depending on a couple of parameters, like for example the amount of fuel that you put into the combustion chamber, uh, the point in time when you do the ignition, um, the geometry of the combustion chamber, and probably you'll come up with, with a couple of hundred different parameters that have an influence on the quality of the combustion. And varying 
uh, some of these parameters simultaneously will have unexpected effects. So even for the expert, it's not usually easy to predict which changes and which parameters create what effect. And this is where parametric optimization comes in. There are other fields of um, other application domains, like uh, you could, for example, think about um, calibrating so-called constant parameters in simulations, like weather simulations or traffic simulations, so that this simulation gives you better predictions. So you could fit this sim simulation to recorded physical data. For example, you could let the, simul the weather simulation predict yesterday's weather based on the weather records from the past 100 years. You know what yesterday's weather was, so you know how good the quality of the prediction is. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of compute time goes in there into each step of the optimization pro process and into uh, each evaluation. <coughs> protein folding would be another one. Now, if you, if you start with a protein which is stretched, which you would never encounter in nature, um, and you want to be able to predict what, what the actual um, protein looks like in nature, then you can use a, a procedure called protein folding. So you need some sort of a model which tells you what the interaction between the different atoms in the molecule is. Um, and you've, there are some rather simple models, uh, and there are quantum mechanical models which take a lot of compute time. But in the end, what you would do is you would apply an optimization algorithm which varies uh, certain parameters of this backbone and searches for a minimum in the potential energy of this, uh, of this molecule. And what you will, for this one, probably come up with in the end is some sort of a, of a coil and other forms as well that you might find. I'm a particle physicist, and this is actually probably the explanation why the Geneva Library is called the Geneva Library, because I've had uh, a lot of dealings with CERN and have worked for two of the experiments there. Um, now, work on the Geneva Library actually started in particle physics. Uh, with the optimization of certain particle physics decays, in this case, though not CERN uh, data, but uh, SLAG data in the Babar experiment. Um, and this is another example from an experiment which is currently being built in uh, the south of Germany, and that would be um, partial wave analysis. Now, I think this one is easier to understand, so I just explain it. Um, what you're looking for if you're doing particle physics analysis is a histogram like this with certain peaks, and it's easy to understand. The more of these peaks you get, and the fewer of, of this background, the better your analysis probably. You want a lot of this good data and well, very few of these background events. And how many of each c category uh, uh, you, you get depends on certain parameters, cut parameters really, where you, where you for example, uh, say this particle is allowed to only is only allowed to have a momentum in a certain value range. So you've got already two parameters in the lower and upper boundary. You do this for different particle types. Or you, you've got an angle between a decay angle, which may be in a certain range. So you can uh, apply cuts to the analysis and only allow certain um, decays to enter this histogram. Now, um, if you've got a certain set of parameters or cuts, then uh, you need to create this histogram, and this means running over probably a couple of hundred thousand decays. So that's something which is, again, computationally quite expensive. Uh, an almost trivial example is the training of a feed-forward neural network. Um, again, here, uh, you can have cases with a lot of uh, computing power needed for each evaluation of a given parameter set. Um, if you've got a lot of training data. It really depends on the data that you need to use for, your, uh, for the training of your network. <coughs> so many problems, many optimization problems uh, that you find in science or in industry or anywhere else can be described in terms of a set of parameters, be it floating point parameters, integer, boolean, um, and a computer implemented, and that's important, evaluation function that assigns numeric quality to them. So we've got some sort of a mapping from some parameter set 
to an evaluation. <coughs> and this brings me to what I understand under the term parametric optimization. To me it means it refers to the selection of the best available element from a set of alternatives according to a computer implemented evaluation criterion. That's closely related to mathematical optimization because you're searching for extreme values, maximum or minimum values. I think it might also already become clear that parametric optimization is, is pretty, much, pretty much a generic thing. Right? Optimization algorithms and optimization problems are two very distinct things. What you need is the mapping from the parameter set to an evaluation. Um, however, we can usually not apply unmodified mathematical algorithms to this evaluation cr criterion because just imagine you do a database lookup in your function, you cannot create the first derivative of a database lookup or an if statement. Just, you just can't. <coughs> Um, one thing here is important, and that is uh, this statement, it's the best available element from a set of alternatives because almost always the result you will get will be limited by the amount of compute power that is available to you and the size of the problem. You will always, almost never get the ideal solution which refers uh, to the best possible result, theoretically possible result. You will always never get that, at least for realistic and large problems. <coughs> of course, a number of other similarities between mathematical optimization and parametric optimization. Um, one being that um, you can have in your evaluation criterion uh, local optima, and there will be usually one global optimum, but there can be a lot of global optima as well, then by definition they will have the same uh, size. Um, and some algorithms for searching minima and maxima of mathematical functions can be adapted to fit parametric optimization. Now, this comes again back to the statement that uh, what you will get is the best available result. Um, what you can, of course, not do is some sort of a brute force uh, uh, approach. Imagine you've got 100 floating point parameters which contribute to your evaluation. Um, and each evaluation takes just a single second uh, on a single CPU core. And this means if you try out just two values for each parameter, that you need to evaluate two to the power of 100 parameter sets to find the best parameter set amongst them. And with one second evaluation time, this amounts to four times something with many zeros years. Uh, probably uh, longer than you want to calculate and then uh, the rest of the universe will last. Uh, so it's pretty much impossible uh, to do a brute force approach here. Of course, no one tells you that the best solution is not just in between the two values we've tried. Um, so what we need is special algorithms that avoid visiting every single parameter set, which as we said is impossible anyway. Um, and even better, these can be easily parallelized. A very simple solution would be, well, to demonstrate it, I would have to walk out of the room and then I'm out of the picture of this camera. The easiest solution is just walk downhill. Find out, in one way or another, the direction of steepest descent. Uh, and then you make the assumption that the global optimum is in that direction. You make a step in that direction and you start from the beginning. And this, of course, works very well for a parabola, but it won't work for a function like this, because there you will end up just in the next local optimum. It just won't work. However, that's, it's the origin of this is, of course, of gradient descent, of course, a mathematical uh, procedure, uh, and it can be adapted to real-life optimization problems uh, by just going to the uh, difference quotient, quotient instead of the differential. Right. So you just make uh, finite steps instead of infinite steps. <clears throat> what the Geneva Library started with was, however, evolutionary strategies. And that's an algorithm which would actually be able and is able to perform optimization on this function very well. 
and it's actually also quite easy to understand. So you start with some value here, the start value, um, and you scatter candidate solutions around that. And the, pro the, the idea here is that the density of the candidate solutions increases with decreasing distance from the start value. Then you choose the best solution out of these solutions. Scatter again new candidate solutions around that, choose the best individual, and so on. And you can already see here, this is we are looking from the top onto a parabola, two-dimensional parabola. You can already see that we very quickly approach uh, the global optimum. And this is something which is quite actually quite capable of performing optimization on a very noisy input function. Um, it's very tolerant with respect to local optima. Um, Compute times can be adapted to the uh, to the devices that you have, so they scale with the size of the population. And if you look at this picture, it's actually quite easy to parallelize because the evaluation of each of these candidate solutions is virtually independent from the other candidate solutions. It can be slower than a gradient descent, but then again, if the gradient descent takes you to the next local optimum, then that's probably not what you want. And just to give you to show you this in real life, not just with a PowerPoint generated picture. Uh, we are looking here from the top into this function, the rust trigger function, which has many, many local optima. We start with this, this set of candidate solutions. Here you see the fitness, where in this case a low fitness value denotes a good value. We are minimizing here. And we're choosing the best value. <coughs> we scatter again new candidate solutions around that. And this is how it continues. And we very quickly, within just three iterations, approach the global optimum. You can, now, however, already see a disadvantage of this approach because evolutionary strategies are actually not very well capable of uh, adapting to the environment, well, to the, to the um, quality surface, to, to its characteristics. Uh, in this environment, it would make sense to, to, to have, well, um, to decrease the step width so that this uh, scattered set of candidate solutions would be narrower because this is where we want to go, right? So evolutionary strategies cannot adapt as quickly uh, to the environment as other algorithms, but they can do the rough work for you. Very well. when, you when you say this is third iteration, I mean, it's actually... It's a fourth, actually. Yeah, but the number of evaluations of the function is much larger than this. Right? Yes. Uh, I mean, the number of evaluations of the function is equal yeah. to the number of candidate solutions, no. right? So in each iteration, you evaluate all candidate solutions. However, if you've ju got just got whatever, 10 CPU cores or something, um, let's make it eight, make it realistic, then you could create the, po the population of just eight individuals, or probably you, you choose a multiple of that. Yeah. Yeah. So you can adapt the size of the population to your optimization problem. Uh, there are other algorithms, like particles form algorithms. Um, and here, members of neighborhoods um, of candidate solutions are drawn into the direction of the globally best solution at that time, the best solution of the neighborhood and into a random direction. Another interesting algorithms would be the great deluge algorithms of simulated annealing, which is related, um, with, for example, line search or simplex as rather simple algorithms. And I've again got some pictures here. Um, so we start with, in this case, I believe 10 neighborhoods. And each neighborhood consists of a number of candidate solutions which, which are initialized with the same value, so they start from the same uh, area. It's again the restrigin function, however, to make it a little bit more interesting, the value range has now been increased from minus 10,000 to 10,000 in each direction. Um, and um, this means that the ev evaluation um, uh, by the fitness of the best individual, which you see here as a little red dot, uh, is 10 to the power of 7, as opposed to whatever that was for evolutionary strategies, I think it was something, something like 30 or so. So, in the next step, the individuals are, are drawn towards the globally best solution and the local best solution, 
the local best solution is identical for all individuals of one neighborhood, so they're all drawn into one area. We select the next global best solution. And we are already moving in to the global optimum, which is here, right? And this is the best solution of this iteration. And there we go. Um, so within, again, just four iterations, we've gone down from 10 to the power of 7 to, in this case, an evaluation of uh, 15,900, uh, which is, I would say, a big improvement. Okay. These examples were calculated with the Geneva library. That's not the usual use case for it, uh, because uh, the evaluation of each candidate solution, of course, doesn't take long. It's, it's a good way to visualize, uh, visualize what happens. So, um, let's talk about the Geneva library itself. It wants to provide users with an environment that um, lets them solve optimization problems of any size transparently, independent of what sort of device they use. So, we want to provide the capability of performing in parallel optimization procedures on devices ranging from single core machines over many core machines over clusters all the way to grids and clouds where fault tolerance of course matters. We want to provide pretty much a warehouse of different optimization algorithms which all work on the same problem descriptions which as I've said are pretty much independent from the optimization algorithms themselves so that you can choose the best algorithm for the task at hand because not every algorithm is well suited for every optimization problem. We target optimization problems whose figure of merit requires very long-lasting computations, um, um, which I think has not been done often so far, and there are not many solutions like this on the market, uh, because um, typically it's considered to be uh, a very complex issue to perform such optimization tasks in parallel on, on uh, uh, many core machines and in clusters. <coughs> there are many complexities involved, and this is something we want to help users with, with this library. Uh, and typical single and multi core machines do not offer sufficient computing power for many problems. If one evaluation can take you uh, a day, maybe, these problems exist in fusion research, for example, um, then, well, you probably want to have 500 machines working in parallel on the same problem, uh, all performing evaluations. Please. Okay, but the scope is still that an evaluation of one data point fits on one node. Yes, okay. right. We do not, and we cannot, of course, provide generic parallelization of any sort of optimization problem. No, 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 that, but the support yeah. for that will come, I guess, with bigger problems that we, we want to have. Well, what the user input here comes through the evaluation function, hmm. right? What sort of evaluation function goes in there is up to the user, and if the user is capable of parallelizing his or her work, for example, uh, if he would send an MPI job on 100 nodes in order to get a single evaluation, uh, all this could run parallel on the evaluation function level as well. But what we can do, since we do not know what the library is being used for, we can parallelize on the level of the algorithms. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to parallelize lower down because you need to evaluate at least mm -hmm. 10,000 evaluations to do anything. So yes. unless, unless you have more than 10,000 cores, say, well, yeah, um, you're not gaining anything. All right, we, we have 10,000, I think we have 12,000 cores in my home institute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but however, yes, I agree that most problems uh, will be of the kind that fit on a single machine for one evaluation. Yeah. For one evaluation. Yeah. But it, I think today it's quite easy to find uh, institutions that have a couple of hundred cores sitting around, most of the time actually idle. And in, in times of, of cloud computing, you can get them on demand when you need them. And this library allows to run your optimization problem in a cloud environment. So, and Amazon won't say no if you want to have 100,000 nodes for a couple of years. <laughs> right. um, it's important to note that um, 
that uh, there's again there's a very clear separation between optimization algorithms, which is what the Geneva Library does, and the problem definition. So the problem definition involves some sort of a model of reality. This model can take parameters, and it's the Geneva Library's duty to provide better parameters in every iteration based on the characteristics of the candidate solutions that, that, were, that were found before. So Geneva pr provides the parameters, these are evaluated through the model, and so on. And how good the result is that you in the end find really depends very much on how good the model of reality is. <coughs> so of course, parameter optimization cannot give you better results than what the model gives you. Right? But this is also a means of making implicit knowledge explicit. So experience is something very fuzzy. Maybe you don't know why this solution is better than the other. But if you've got an evaluation function to try out what works best, maybe you can find out what contributes to your experience and what contributes to a good solution. And this can help you to create sustainable solutions in business and science. So, um, we currently, um, as I said, focus on long-lasting and very computationally expensive evaluation functions. So one design crit criterion was we don't want to have the core library uh, crash uh, after 10 days of computation. So it's written in a way that it's very stable. It's supposed to never crash. Of course, it can crash. Every software can crash. But we've tried to write it in a way that it is very stable at the expense of efficiency. Efficiency of the core library doesn't really matter for us because we assume that the few milliseconds that, that we spend in the core library are a small amount of time compared to the duration of the evaluation function. So we can afford to make the core library stable. Um, and of course, stability in the context of distributed environments requires quite a bit of fault toler tolerance. We can do a serial, which is important uh, for debugging purposes, serial optimization, multi-threaded optimization, and network execution. Um, uh, there are some implications, particularly of the multi-threaded execution, um, where there may be no global variables. I think this is clear in a multi-threaded environment. And as for the network execution, um, user-defined data structures must be serializable using boost, the boost serialization library. Uh, and there should be, and there is, a familiar interface, so everything um, exhibits most of the X STL uh, vector interface uh, for data representation for candidate solutions, which I call individuals in the context of this talk, and populations. So, um, algorithms in order to be fault tolerant must be able to repair themselves if some of these evaluations do not return because someone somewhere in the world has unplugged a network cable, which will happen. Right? So, uh, they may, must have some sort of a, of a cutoff um, which uh, allows you to go on to the next iteration. Um, late answers are still considered, so if they come back later, uh, they are still integrated into the optimization procedure, however, they are not required to return. And the amount of time that the algorithm waits in each iteration for, uh, for responses to return, it has in some uh, sort or another has to mimic or has to reflect the, um, the optimization problem, because uh, the du duration of the evaluation function, of course, can be different for each problem. What it does actually, it, it measures the time needed for the return of the first individual. If no individuals return, which is unrealistic, then you're in trouble. But if you know the time that is needed for the first individual or candidate solution to return from its journey through a network, uh, then you can make an educated guess as to what is a realistic time frame for a reasonable number of individuals to return. Um, we do not require public IP for clients because they, uh, they work in pull mode. They contact the server, and the server actually doesn't know much about clients. It just responds. 
and gives them at, at their request new work items and receives work items back and sorts them back into the uh, sources of the candidate solutions which then have to do something with them. This means that we can run the clients, for example, in a, in a cluster which doesn't allow uh, um, external entities to contact the worker nodes, which is quite often the case. In a cluster you usually don't have public IPs. The only thing that needs a public IP is the server. Um, use a portable build environment, CMake, and of course, in order to make it stable, there must be unit tests. That's again based on Boost, um, Boost test. Um, and we even provide that for user codes so they can check uh, their code. Well, uh, no surprise there, it's, it's C++, currently about 80,000 lines of code with some proprietary uh, extensions that we have. Um, mostly Linux-based at this point in time. Again, no surprise there because uh, uh, I think over 90% of the top 500 fastest machines in the world are Linux machines and this is targeted at this kind of machine. So uh, the fact that we use Linux uh, doesn't, uh, well, it's in line with our, our goals and strategies. It's likely portable because the only external dependency really is Boost. Um, and so far we tested it, as, it with various G++ versions, of course, but also with Intel. Um, we still have to port it to Microsoft when the use case arises, which actually currently might be the case because we're talking to a possible user of that who only has Microsoft or Windows code. <laughs> Some of the major components. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, it said the Geneva Library collection is actually the, the, all the code has been separated in different, pretty much independent libraries. Um, so we've got the representation of the parameter sets the optimization algorithms, all different optimization algorithms act on the same structure of parameter sets. Um, and of course we've got parallelization and communication, and there's something called random number factory, and since I won't talk about that in more detail, I just uh, uh, let me explain it because I, I think it's quite cool. Um, optimization, it's, it's, uh, it has seasons where you where you perform a lot of computation and you've got times where your computation is pretty much idle and does not, that, where your compute node does nothing. Um, so what we do is we produce in a random number factory packages of random numbers while the system is idle. They come, go into a, into a, a thread safe buffer um, and whenever, well, whenever random, random numbers are needed, they're consumed um, where packages are handed out to some, something like a random number proxy which sits in each um, object that needs random numbers. So there's a random number proxy. For the object it looks like pretty much like it's talking to its own local random number generator. However, uh, it's consuming random numbers out of the buffer. And that buffer is empty, the proxy takes a new random number bu buffer and hands out again start sending out random numbers. Uh, so are you actually using the boost random number generators on the line? That's, uh, that's the back end, yes. One of, one of the benefits of this is really that uh, with many objects needing random numbers, you, you're, you're, if they all would have their own random number, you would have tremendous problems with um, seeds, handing out seeds and everything. Here we have got a global factory, so we, we seed, um, uh, what if you need more random numbers than that? Well, um, then you, you, you create more threads if you... If you um, it's a multi-threaded factory, right? But it's all running on the same seed. So, no. No, well, it's not. We, we, first, we first create a random set of seeds which are not unique, okay. yeah. right? And yeah. we distribute them to all real random numbers sitting in the threads. Right. But we do not have to distribute them to all objects, which can be a couple of hundred thousand objects that need random numbers. It would and be very difficult. It is indeterministic always, even if I prescribe the seeds, because I don't know who will start generating random numbers when exactly. Yes, and I don't know which path the optimization will take. 
So it's yeah, pretty much indeterministic. Okay. Yeah. And the initial seed actually can come from uh, from a very indeterministic source, mm -hmm. uh, which takes time. You cannot do this for, for every random number generator if you've got 100,000 of them. But, so in this way, we can provide quite high quality random numbers, which is important for parametric optimization. Uh, I cannot give you an introduction to the to all of uh, uh, Geneva, of course, but uh, <coughs> probably this is more marketing slide. I guess uh, this is how a main function would look like. Of, like, of course, there's more to it, uh, and if you want to do your own uh, optimization, well, what you need to do is really uh, derive um, a class from from another class called G parameter set and plug it into the algorithms, but. But the point here is um, that it's, uh, there's a complete framework that lets you um, that specify your optimization problems. And as for the optimization algorithms, they all behave pretty much the same. This is actually what you would need for all execution modes, network, multi-threaded, um, or serial. Uh, and you see here this pushback um, where they all have an SDL interface and they're not derived from standard vector. Um, and I won't go into every class, but uh, I just want to give you the idea that this is actually quite a complex problem, and this is where the optimization algorithms are. And in the overall code base of some 80,000 lines of code, uh, the algorithms themselves are maybe 20% of the overall code base. And there are many other components that, that need code here. So it's, uh, programming this goes far beyond optimization algorithms. Um, however, the, the, the biggest um, benefit for the user is having many optimization algorithms. And the point here is then that um, adding new algorithms isn't really that much of, of a work based on this framework that we already have. Right? So when a new algorithm is needed, we can create it without having to program another 80,000 lines of code. And debugging it. Right. So, um, well that would be the core classes. Um, just, just, let's just pick something. The personality traits give personality to candidate solutions because certain optimization algorithms need to store certain specific data in the uh, candidate solutions. Um, they are all derived from one base class G object. Um, we've got monitoring equipment here, so you can monitor the entire uh, optimization. Uh, optimization algorithms can already build on uh, predefined um, on, on, on a given infrastructure. Uh, and here comes another important thing. Um, optimization algorithms can act as candidate solutions themselves, so you can do meta evolution. You can plug in, for example, an evolutionary strategy as the item being optimized into an evolutionary strategy by algorithm in that case. So, in, in a way, they behave pretty much like problem definitions and candidate solutions. And I think that's a cool feature that you can really, really do meta-evolution. You could, you could even let different algorithms compete against each other and see which one performs best. best. However, there would be a lot of computing overheads there. Out of curiosity, what is the G object for? What can this mm -hmm. interface do? Um, maybe this will become a little clear a little bit later. Uh, the individuals, the candidate solutions, when these candidate solutions re really represent parameter sets, can contain different parameter types. Predefined are Boolean, floating point, and integer, but you can pretty much plug in anything you like as long as you tell the library how it should be modified. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, this means that we need to talk to the parameters through some base pointer, and this happens actually in many places of the library. I get that for, for the parameters and stuff, but I don't see the optimization monitor in that, or the personality um, um, scope. That's where, where I wonder whether this yeah. is a generic Maybe top level call, class or. Call, call it laziness. <laughs> um, in G-Object, there's, there's quite a bit of code which facilitates serialization. 
Uh -huh. So we can do two, two string from string or two, two binary two from binary and okay. stuff. So general so, serialization. Yeah. So this this distributes some infrastructure mm -hmm. to the other classes that need serialization, um, and you, you might have your own parameters, your your objects, your mon optimization monitor objects might have state. Mm -hmm. If you serialize that, then you need this infrastructure. Just do. I mean, the, and this this inheritance is just plain polymorphic virtual functions in the it's not yes. templates. Yeah. It's not templates. No. Um, an early version of the library, quite a few years ago, used uh, templates. I found this approach to be more flexible. Um, an in individual or uh, a sample solution would consist uh, of different parameter definitions, different types. There could, there could be type X with a certain constraint. You may have constraints where you say this floating point parameter may only have assume values between zero and three, whatever. Uh, so there may be constraints. There may be another type Y. Um, any number of parameters, really. We've tested this with up to 100,000 parameters, uh, which would be a size of an optimization problem you would probably never encounter in nature because it's too big. Um, the search space would be too big to find a good solution. And part of this individual, which is an object, is the evaluation function. We've got different optimization algorithms. Not all can act on all parameter types. So if you choose an optimization algorithm not capable of acting on a given parameter type, it will assume it as being constant. Right? So if it can only act on floating point but not an integer, the integer parameters will stay constant if you use this optimization algorithm. Um, this is whose shared pointer throughout. Um, so this would be an evolutionary algorithm, which consists of parents and children or candidate solutions. And such a candidate solution could, for example, contain collections of bits, doubles, integers, any object you give us that complies to the Geneva API, and for which you tell us uh, how to adapt it. Um, and as I said, you can even plug in populations into populations. So you can, like in real life, let populations compete against each other. So this would mean that your, each population would take a different path and then learn from the other one after a certain number of iterations. Um, as we can have such meta evolution, we need a broker which can deal with an unknown number of sources for items to be evaluated uh, at an unknown number of clients consuming these evaluations. Um, so this is a rough um, sketch of how this works. Uh, so you, you, each population puts um, items into buffers, into raw buffer. Um, clients talk to consumer, which actually implements the network infrastructure. So you could plug in MPI. Uh, code here as well, although apparently that's not the case. We go through boost ASIO. Um, they get the work, return it. This one sorts it back into uh, the different buffers, and uh, the population can retrieve it back. Pay attention. Sorry. Sure. I have a question on the broker. Sure. Is it coupled to the population so that it knows what the type is for the source of the Once work? Again, sorry, it, does the broker know about the population type so no. that it knows where the work is coming from, or is what? it generic? That it's the, just the, the broker it's itself, work? it's actually it's, it's a template, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the template, of course, it assumes a certain API that needs to be there, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but in the end, it doesn't know what the type is. That's good. Yeah. All right. Um, so today we've got evolutionary algorithms, particle swarm optimization, which I've shown you both in, uh, in an example, gradient descent and simulated, simulated annealing, or a variant of that, that can be parallelized. Um, can have mixed problem de uh, descriptions and meta-evolution. Um, let's talk a bit about performance. This is on a 48-core AMD system, like a core system. Um, in multi-threaded mode, obviously, uh, you can see here that it uses more CPU time than is available, which is, of course, a problem of the Linux top program. 
but the point here is that it, it is able to saturate pretty much any machine that you give it. Um, and this is a real application, this is a partial wave analysis in physics, which runs incredibly fast. It's a really it's a nice toy. So, uh, and let me um, thank Steinberg Center for Computing for letting me use that. <coughs> now the feature of parametric optimization, again in the case of partial wave analysis, is that, um, that most of the progress that you get happens in the very beginning of the optimization procedure. So if, if you've got an incredibly um, complex evaluation function that takes 10 days to run, for example, you could still perform parametric optimization with it. However, you would probably not go over all iterations. You would probably stop at one point. But for many problems, if you can have 20% improvement instead of the factor of uh, 100,000 that you got in this case, uh, even 20% improvement for, for, uh, for a car uh, in, in the consumption of fuel can be uh, worth a lot, right? So most of the improvement you get in the very beginning. It's particularly uh, true for evolutionary algorithms. Um, speed up in a cluster as opposed to multi-threaded execution. What you see here is the speed up as a function of the evaluation time. So the question is, uh, how long should your evaluation function calculate so that it makes sense to run this in a cluster as opposed to a multi-core machine? Of course, multi-threaded execution pretty much instantly uh, gets the maximum speed up, in this case of 16, because we're using 16 candidate solutions. Um, and um, for network execution, um, what, what we get uh, is that maybe for 20 seconds or so, you get an almost linear speed up. If you calculate longer, which is common for many optimization problems, uh, you don't have to worry whether you're running in a cluster or on a multi-core machine. Uh, there's another feature which is important here, and this, this is that these are actually two different curves. This is a network mode in a cluster with no other uh, programs running in the same cluster, so there was no concurrency as, as for the, the, the network connection. And uh, the second calculation happened with local networking on a system with uh, 16 cores, and this is the reason why, why we've chosen an evolutionary strategy with 16. Uh, candidate solutions. And what you see here is that the network overhead, the transfer of the data of the network with gigabit Ethernet, uh, doesn't play a big role because the two, um, the two curves are pretty much the same. So this means that the overhead through the, uh, introduced through the broker and the serialization process uh, really accounts for most of the overhead. Right? Because we, we've cut out, in the case of local networking, we, we've cut out the effect of the transfer of the network. All we do is happens in memory, virtually, virtually instantly. Is your average speed up there that 16 times, you know? Uh, 16 times the uh, like execution the time board. of serial execution. So if you run yeah, the right. same application yeah. on one core, it takes X amount. Okay. And here it's one sixteenth of that time. That's serial execution, that is, right? So it's not one core with 16 workers and a server. Which, where this would look much better, actually. Um, now, um, a colleague of mine, um, Christian Kumpe, has created an evolution strategy based on Hadoop. Um, I'm not sure whether I've come across Hadoop, MapReduce, um, and what what we sh what what we see here. And I apologize that the labels are actually in German because I've put this slide in this morning. Actually, um, what we see here is a comparison between the speed up we get with Hadoop, which is this green line, and Geneva, and a threaded mode of this program Hadoop Optimizer. Right. So this is what you get if you go through boost ASRO, the lowest level sockets really, 
and this is what you get if you go through Hadoop with the Java program. Mm -hmm. This will eventually get to the maximum speed of, in this case, of 48, because it was a, uh, a strategy with 48 uh, candidate solutions. But the point is, if you go uh, through C++ with Boost and Serialization, Boost Serialization Library and or Broker, uh, you're probably faster than this. However, to do justice to this, uh, Hadoop is becoming pretty much a de facto standard for performing, um, well, maybe use operations in the cloud, and it's, it's, it's pretty uh, widespread, and the, the usage of that is pretty widespread at the moment. So, um, if your evaluation function is long enough, it also makes sense to use the head optimizer. So, um, here's a use case, which is more well, a toy use case, which I find a little bit cool. Um, imagine you've got 300 semi-transparent triangles, and each triangle has 10 parameters, meaning it has an alpha channel, transparency really, uh, coordinates and colors, mounting to 10 parameters per triangle. This means you've got 3,000 parameters. Now you've got a target image, and you've got some random selection of triangles. You want to modify the parameters of each triangle in such a way that all these triangles together, put on top of each other, look like the Mona Lisa. And this is what the Geneva library has done here. You can see the, 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 the Mona Lisa here appearing out of the mist. Uh, you, you will never get an exact match, but I think it's pretty uh, recognizable that this is the Mona Lisa. Um, so. I saw a news article a Sorry? while ago. I saw a news article a while ago about this. And uh, was that uh, article about your project, or did you take that as an example and do this? Uh, I remember to have seen uh, um, uh, this this. Uh, News. I think it appeared on SourceForge. That's actually a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, this may well have inspired this, but this has um, appeared later. Yeah. How will do this? But but it's not uh, something you can only do with Geneva. Mm -hmm. The Hadoop optimizer have shown the same with the with the logo. But I think it's it's a pretty cool application of optimization algorithms. Yeah. Good question. How long did it take? Long. <laughs> well, um, so this kilowatt hours. This is the useful unit. In this right. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm a take. I'm not sure. I want to say. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's computationally very expensive, and doing this on standard CPU is, is not really what you want to do. Probably you would want to use a GP GPU system for this, which is not currently implemented in Geneva. Um, if you do this, in our case, it was done with image magic and graphics magic. Uh, if you do this on a standard CPU, it takes a long time. So assembling just one picture in a, in a decent resolution can take you two, three seconds. Yeah, Plus you've, you've got you've got a lot of um, a lot of training. Well, three hundred. Yeah. Does this represent twenty iterations? Did it kind of converge on that? No. Nope. Nope. There's <laughs> okay. many more iterations. Um, what you see here, to give some credit to my employer again, this mm -hmm. is the logo of uh, Steinbuch Center for Computing and a much shorter calculation with fewer triangles, just to make the point that it's not just the Mona Lisa that can do this. And you could get a better result if this would run longer. But this was actually done on a quad-core machine um, locally overnight, to give you an idea. So, um, Geneva and Boost. Boost is the only real external dependency. Um, and this is important for us because ultimately we want to be um, uh, very portable. We don't want to be limited to Linux. It's our main platform at the moment, and that is OK. But if someone wants to use it in different environment, it's important, it's important for us um, to be able to port it, actually. And, and this is where, where Boost comes in, because it's so highly uh, high quality and highly portable. Uh, we use in no particular order, and I've left out probably half a dozen different libraries here as well. Uh, Boost SO for uh, well, network transfers, really. Uh, Boost serialization, uh, threads, uh, smart pointers. This is very important for us. That's a godsend. 
uh, many different cars, boost by and boost function, um, lexical cars, boost test we've named already. Um, if I if I search deep enough, uh, well, re really the first approach when I, when I come across a problem where I think I should implement some code, the first approach is have a look in the boost libraries. Is it there? Use it. Works is advertised most of the time. Um, sometimes well documented, um, but it's, it's it's quite easy actually to get the hang of it. Um, so a clear statement here is development of Geneva would not have been possible without boost. Okay, so to whoever the authors of these libraries are, and I hope to meet some of them here, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you uh, to you, to, to all of them, and Boost is a tremendous help from the user point of view. Um, incidentally, there was a discussion about making it known to the public that one uses Boost, and there was a discussion about logos of Boost, and this is actually a, a big wish of mine. I'd love to have a logo which says, uses Boost, and put it on our web page and in the documentation, uh, just to give credit where credit is due. Um, that doesn't currently exist. So that's a big wish. Um, and speaking of things I might want to have, we're currently using a Fredpool library from SourceForge, fredpool.sourceforge.net, which is Boostify, so it runs with Boost. It's not part of Boost. Um, I know there's, there's a Fredpool implementation in the making for Boost, so I'm desperately waiting for that because I really want to build all of Geneva on boost code and boost only. <coughs> it's open source, Geneva. Meaning there's no vendor login, just like in the case of boost. Um, the license. <laughs> sorry? What's the license? There's a license, yes. Uh, but the the, sorry? What's the license? license? It's the fair GPL version 3. Because okay. we we this is a network application, and you know about the, the um, there's a loophole in the in the GPL version 3, which allows for a software as a service uh, software or, um, infrastructure, which, which would um, allow uh, providers of, in this case, optimization services to keep their modifications of the code private. If, if it would be under the GPL version 3 with a fair GPL, this is explicitly ruled out. So it's designed uh, particularly for such problems which act in a network environment. And using this in a software as a service environment is of course one of the ideas behind it. it means you've got full control over what happens and all the other benefits, customer driven development. Um, I've been in the Linux area, I've been active since 92, so I'm very convinced of what happens with, uh, with open source. However, what I experience is that users can be sometimes suspicious. I guess that's the same uh, for all of you if you write open source applications. Can you, can you explain that? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by suspicious. Well, um, what, one thing is they don't quite understand why one does that. There's a lot of work that has gone into Geneva, quite a few many years actually. So oh, users are this, suspicious that it's open source, so therefore it's crap, right? More. Actually, I've heard that being said. Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I, I, thought so, that, I thought that they might be going around in black hats or something. Yeah, they're, they're, they look suspicious. Of, yeah, I understand. <laughs> Users are suspicious of Geneva, Geneva being the result. Yes. Yeah. So, so how do you make your money? Um, again, I'm not sure whether I want to give you all my business model in uh, front of the camera. <laughs> uh, um, we are happy to talk about deployment scenarios in your environment. <laughs> uh, but there are many business models, actually. And I've, I've done an entire MBA on that, so I hope I understand the issues. So, just a summary. Um, with uh, doing distributed parametric optimization, you get short development cycles uh, through parallelization and you get good results even after a few cycles. Uh, so in many cases it helps you uh, already to have a 20% improvement of many problems. Uh, there are robust optimization algorithms 
robust with respect to local optima and missing responses. Um, I must honestly say that currently uh, the oldest optimization algorithm here, the evolution strategies, uh, is, is one that's most mature. Geneva currently is at the status of version 0.92, so it's not 1.0 yet. This will happen certainly this year. Um, we're not happy with what we got. Um, the other algorithms will mature. I have shown you and I can show in different cases that they perform well and there are some areas where they don't perform as well as I would wish. So I need to get on top of that. Um, we have demonstrated good scalability for computationally expensive problems. Um, and there's virtually no limit to the type of deployment scenarios. And again, thank you to all of Boost. All of this would have not been possible without Boost. Before we end the session, I'd just like to thank the organizers of this event, the audience, and the sponsors of Geneva's de development, which includes um, Steinbuch Center for Computing, Karls Institute of Technology, and Helmholtz Gemeinschaft Deutsche Forschungszentren. Uh, with that, that said, good questions, shoot away. Yes, thank you very much. So, where's the URL to download it? Okay, um, it's uh, hosted on Launchpad. And, I would have Googled it, but the wireless isn't yeah. working, so yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a problem. So, uh, in case you don't know, Launchpad is the, the portal that's used for Ubuntu. Uh, so it's provided by uh, Canonical in the end. Um, so this is where you would get the source code, and um, probably you have seen on one of the slides the, the Gemfony URL. It's just www.gemfony. Com. Um, and that's where you get more information or if you want I've got business cards here just contact me both for scientific yeah I've got the KIT hat on for scientific optimization problems or if you're interested in using this in any commercial environment talk to me as well and I've got business cards here so have you considered contributing pieces of it as boost library proposals um, <laughs> I'm uh, well. That's that's one of the things when our business model has settled down that I have actually considered and I've made sure that it's possible with all the stakeholders of this code, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it is possible, but I first want to be sure that our business model, the way we expect it, works. Mm -hmm. If not, I have might have to choose another path. Um, one thing um, I'm afraid of is, is really the long duration of, um, that, that it takes from a proposal of a new library to it being accepted in, into Boost, which has to do with the amount of people working on it. All of you are working, if you're working on libraries, you're doing that voluntarily uh, and in your own time, probably. Some of you might be paid to do that, but most of the time it's, it's, it's your own time. So I cannot expect that to happen immediately. Uh, I actually have a proposal for solving this issue. If you want to have a well, visit my talk on Thursday uh, about maybe being able to use um, research funds to fund some of the development, uh, well, just come to my presentation on Thursday. That's, that's actually, I must say, this is a, a pretty much a brainstorming session. The idea I'm going to present that won't take longer than half an hour. What I want to have there is a lively discussion where people contribute their experience with their own academic research projects being funded in the US and probably by National Science Foundation uh, in Germany by some other entity. You've done a lot of work in there that would be in common with many other research projects that are using network computer systems and yes. could we use your components? Um, well, they can we use them now, it's only that they're in GPL. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that shouldn't bother the academics. No. They need to know they exist 
And so if they were loose libraries, they would be well advertised. Right. Um, I have been thinking about this actually. Well advertised. It's, it's, it's very hard to find like uh, what's going on sometimes in these too many libraries. And stuff. But not everything is well advertised, I gotta say that. People at least know it's a go to place. But so is launch time. Well, I mean, I think if you're an academic, you should be doing your literature search, comprehensive literature search, before you start your project, right? Yes. That's all academics do that. <laughs> very, very thorough. Literature searches. I just I, I think that the point is you need to build a community, just like Boost. We need to build a community, right? And this will shape, for example, the license that we are willing to provide this or not. If the community is big enough and uh, we can make the case that we, we can make a viable business out of this with a big community, if the community is big enough, you can do this, uh, then boostifying it is an option. Right, but 